But today we're going to have a conversation about intelligent life in the universe. And so I'm setting the timer so that we are not tardy. And but we you run go. the session, so you could no, give us a no. few extra minutes. No, if we, the if rules. We needed it. No, no. <laughs> I'm a stickler for rules. All right, so we're here honoring uh, Stephen Hawking in many ways. And I'm curious about what Stephen's best guess right now is about um, how an ETI Earthling interaction might turn out. Um, you know, he's on record as being pessimistic. And I'm on record as saying he might be wrong. Um, Which means okay, he might be right. So what's your take? He might be wrong also means he might be right. That's right. Yeah, logically. Mm. Yeah. So what do you think, sir? Uh, I think uh, Stephen Hawking's famous proclamation, one of many that he makes, that aliens coming upon us will, if they managed to find us, it meant they traveled through the depths of intergalactic or interstellar space on ships that we can only dream about. So clearly they'll be technologically more advanced than we are. And taking a cue from human civilization that any time a more advanced, technologically advanced civilization encounters a less technologically advanced civilization, it never bodes well for the less technologically advanced civilization. Right, but it there's has disease. never boded well. But there's disease and... Um, so uh, diseases gets can into go both ways. Project. Okay. Now, disease can transmit between humans because we all have common DNA. If you have another kind of species, it's not obvious whether they could catch a human disease any more than an oak tree could catch the human flu, for example. I mean, there's, I, not all viruses work across species that way. Sometimes they jump, but most times not. They're very specific in, in how and what they target. So, sure, diseases can go back and forth. This was the theme in H.G. Wells's War of the Worlds. The only way we were able to defeat, defeat the evil aliens from Mars was because they caught a virus that we had developed an immunity to here on Earth. So very clever infusion of sort of bio, biophysics, bioastrophysics uh, in the day. This and is now. Didn't we put a virus in the code of Independence Day? Yeah, so Independence Day is basically the original. I haven't seen the new one. The, the original is basically a retelling of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds because we defeat the alien powers because we upload a computer virus to it. That was our modern. Uh, way that we dealt with the virus problem. Uh, but I would say that the Stephen Hawking argument, let me, let me take, take a, a positive angle on this. I think the Stephen Hawking argument assumes that aliens will behave the way we know we would treat one another using we as an example for they. But so he's basing it on a mirror to human conduct. Mm -hmm. Today. Today. So it's not on actual knowledge of what, how aliens would behave. It's on, on, on actual knowledge of how humans would behave. And maybe we should give aliens higher credit for conduct than we give ourselves. Well, as you mentioned, if they can get here, they have more advanced technology. Presumably... And what always gets me in these alien movies, yeah. like a spaceship comes from space, and people come out and just shoot their gun at it. Like, <laughs> do they really think... This, they have ray guns exploding buildings, and it's just time to go home at that point. No, what gets me is the spacecraft that come millions of light years and crash in the last mile. Yeah, yeah, I don't have any patience for, <laughs> okay. for alien spaceships that can't navigate and crash land on Earth. You cross the galaxy... At least land safely, otherwise we don't need to have a conversation. <laughs> All right, so um, also the, the um, models of past advanced and less advanced societal uh, interactions have been cotemporal, right? It's the same epoch and the same cultural evolution of the species to that point. What if... So in spite it, of being different in technology, we are basically genetically the same. 
Yes. And, okay. and we're at the same time, mm -hmm. all right? So an advanced technology, an older technology, may have evolved in a way that Steven Pinker is suggesting humans are involved, are, are evolving. In fact, he says we're kinder and gentler than we've ever been, right? So maybe we don't that have that much to the, worry. The Better angels the, of, of, our of, nature. of our nature. Yes. Right, right, right. So maybe we don't really have, if they've managed to get old, maybe they're nice guys. Yeah, I, I, I'm a fan of the fact that we are kinder, kind, kinder and gentler than we've ever been. Uh, I think these arguments are compelling. In spite of the world wars and all the rest of what we think of as really bad times in the history of our species, if you go farther back where everybody was tribal, then tribal warfare was happening all the time. Right. And, and so, so there's some hope that this kind of cultural evolution, which is what this reference is, may bode well for not only how we treat each other, but how we might treat aliens and how aliens who had already gotten there then might treat us. So, I, so I'm a little more positive about this okay. th than others would be. Another part of me that keeps me positive, which is a little, which is simultaneously disturbing and positive, is a sufficiently intelligent civilization I'm pretty sure would have positively no interest in us at all. Right. Any more than as you walk down the street and there's a worm there, you're not wondering, gee, I wonder, what, what is the worm thinking about? Uh, let me see if I can communicate with it, or let me bring my ray guns. You know, it's, why just waste? step on it. You, you just step on it, yes. But you're not gonna step on all the worms, you're gone by then, you get bored quickly. Right. So maybe our biggest protection from being killed by alien powers in the universe is their conclusion that there's no sign of intelligent life on Earth. I think there's a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon I'm to that saying. effect. <laughs> All right, well, Stephen also is um, on record that uh, he thinks it's imperative for Earthlings to become an interplanetary species, but I think you disagree with that a bit. Yeah, no, so I, no, I agree with the idea. Okay, by the way, any time Stephen Hawking says anything from his office in Cambridge, the press gets a hold of it and then I'm like the next person they call yes. in the United States. Could you comment on what he said? So I feel like calling up and saying, Steve, can you give me like a few months break <laughs> for, for a while? Just advance notice? Yeah, just give me, to chill out for a little bit. Uh, so, so, yes, being a multi-planet species, I think that that looks good on paper, all right? Put your eggs in more than one basket. If one basket gets smashed, the eggs are preserved. The species is preserved. Sure, that looks good on paper. In practice, it is completely unrealistic. Because wh what does this involve? Ask yourself, okay, let us Terraform Mars. You're not terraforming Venus, not anytime soon. Turn Mars into an Earth haven. And then what are you gonna do? Ship a billion people there? Okay, so let's do that. Terraform Mars, ship half the population of the Earth. Four billion people, okay. Now a killer asteroid is coming towards Earth. What do we say? We're fine, half of us will live, the four <laughs> billion of you on Earth, too bad. Too bad. Yeah. Are we really going to do that? And my point here is, my point here is, whatever effort it takes to terraform Mars and ship four billion, billion people there, I bet that's more effort than figuring out how to deflect the asteroid in the first place. I bet that's more effort than figuring out how to protect against any super virus. I bet that's more effort than figuring out how to protect us from our own AI inventions. Whatever it is, it's gotta be easier to solve those problems here than ship four billion people to another planet and be okay if half the people are incinerated. And, and the Martian microbes actually might thank you to not terraform their planet, oh, leave yeah, them if alone. The, if any more, yeah, the Martians, you wanna make sure that we're not displacing yet another indigenous community. <laughs> We've got a great history. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not been good. So, yeah, 
you want to terraform planets where there's not already life trying to hang on. So, so I think it plays well as a news headline, let's become a multi-planet species. Carl Sagan, a big fan of this yeah. as well. And who wouldn't be? I want the solar system to be our backyard. But the motivation would not be so that not everyone dies from something we can't prevent. Mm. Because right. let's just build a world where we prevent it and then go to these planets or uh, cosmic destinations for tourist attractions or to do science or to or just find reasons to go there, not just so that you don't die while everyone else does. And figure out if there's anything else there before us. Yes. All right. Um, so maybe Stephen will let us know what he really thinks before the end of the festival. But uh, um, so I need to talk to you about what do you think the probability of the evolution of intelligence on other worlds with life is like? I know you're more pessimistic than I am, but you know how do let you me hear feel your, about this? Let me hear your numbers, and then I'll. They'll jump all over them. Okay. I don't have any numbers, <laughs> right? I, there's no yeah, nobody data. Nobody has numbers. We are, none of there us are have numbers. There are no data. Uh, yeah. I'm simply thinking that our good friend, um, Mr. Dawkins, has pointed out that a predator-prey relationship uh, in, our Dawkins, yeah. Yes, yeah. in our evolutionary history has probably been behind ratcheting up intelligence. And that so that, that we don't get eaten. So that we don't get eaten, and then when uh, the uh, prey gets smarter, the predator has to get smarter so that it doesn't get hungry um, and starve. So I I'm thinking that perhaps that's an evolutionary trick that might be part of the game any place that life gets a start. Okay, so I, I think there are numbers we can invoke here. Okay. If by I'll jump our, all over yours. If, if by our own definitions, we are the only intelligent species there ever was on Earth. And there's, there are ways to define Time. that. Time. No, Time. There, there are ways to define that for that to be true. You can say <laughs> the only species that can build a, uh, a spaceship, okay? So that's us. The dolphins are not building spaceships. So let's just assume this for the moment, okay? Okay. <laughs> Or, or, or have art, or poetry, or... or How do you know dolphins plays. don't have poetry? They don't, they don't have opposable thumbs. They're not doing much other than thinking They could be poets. Okay. So, so, you know my favorite comic is there are two dolphins swimming together, and they look up and they see humans on the shore. And one dolphin says to the other, even though they face each other and make sounds, it's not clear they're actually <laughs> communicating <laughs> with one another. <laughs> All right. So I didn't mean to... No, refer. no. no just I, I don't need to argue over how you might include other species as intelligent. Because I'm making a very different point. So for the purposes of this point, let's define humans as the only intelligent species there ever was on Earth. Okay. Now you can ask, how many total species have there been? And when did intelligence, as we've come to define it, arise? Both of these numbers argue strongly against the high frequency of intelligence in any biota that we might find. Okay, so mammals, which we generally might add more than humans as being intelligent, very late in the evolutionary tree. Uh, the primates, later in the evolutionary tree. Humans, the latest few hundred thousand years in the evolutionary tree. And we've got four billion years of life. If you take a dart and throw it at that timeline, randomly and ask, how often are you hitting an intelligent species? It's hardly ever. So now put planets and scatter them into the galaxy and have life begin at random times on them. Then you come upon them at whatever is their timeline of their evolutionary tree. What are the chances you're hitting intelligence? If Earth is any example, it's hardly ever. Even if the galaxy is teeming with life. Now, now wait a minute. Wait a minute. You know quite well that in this particular corner of the galaxy, our solar system's pretty young. Most of the other stars around here are a billion or so years older than we are. We can only be so twice if, as old as us, not ten times as old. That's all right. Okay. But that if technology, which is sort of the intelligence that you're defining, manages to last for a significant period of time, cosmic timescales, 
right? Then your dart throwing exercise has a lot more probability of hitting a technology than if the technological species is short-lived. Unless, right, unless the technological species does not have the foresight of its own survival. Right. So, okay, now. Wait, 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 now, no, 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 hold on, hold on. So, so consider, however, the contingencies of life. The dinosaurs, as we think of them, thrived on Earth for a longer period of time than has elapsed since the big dinosaurs have gone extinct. Of course, the birds emerged as their descendants. But of the kinds of dinosaurs that would eat us, they were around for longer than the time that's been around since they'd gone extinct from an asteroid. So were it not for that asteroid, there is no reason at all, biologically, to think that they wouldn't still be here. And our mammal ancestors would be these scurrying rodents running underfoot trying to not get eaten. So to speak of our intelligence as something inevitable, when an asteroid might have been the thing that enabled us, I think is overplaying the cards you've been dealt. No, it's, a, it's defining trip. that that's the only way it could happen. You know, you're a physicist. You know that what we really would like to know is the branching ratios. We'd like to do this experiment and know the, the total number of different ways it could come out and how probable it is to go down any pathway. Yes. All right? So and you what, add up all of those probabilities, the, the, the possi possibilities, and they become the probabilities. And then we yes. have something to say, and we yes. just don't, we're not there. But to say that errant an asteroid, we wouldn't be here, or technologi non technological species wouldn't be here, I think is incorrect, because the Earth is not static. If it hadn't been an asteroid, it might have been some other catastrophe. Extinction events, major extinction events, have happened multiple times. We're forcing one now ourselves. I would not have said it had the dinosaurs not been around for longer than the time that they've been extinct. That is my evidence that there's no reason to think they would all of a sudden become extinct in the 65 million years that followed the 250 million years they were on the Earth. That's what I'm using, that, that, the, past, that the past evidence of how long they have thrived, how successful they were uh, as, a, as a community of animals, whatever the branch would, a biologist would call, call them, uh, I'm not given any reason to think that they wouldn't still be here surviving whatever cycles of ice ages, carbon dioxide cycles, and the like. But we know that that's not been the history of the planet. You know, animal species have a good run at a million years, perhaps. Yeah. The dinosaurs had better than average, but I don't think that we should expect that they would have continued on. I think something would have... No, they might have morphed into other kinds of dinosaurs, right? Totally. That's what they did over the time that I'm describing. So I'm just saying that over the time when you had huge animals with big teeth that like eating tasty rodents, it didn't bode well for the rise of mammals. That's kind of all I'm saying. So it took a catastrophic event to change things. A highly contingent catastrophic event on this planet way late in the time that life has been on Earth. That's right. Okay. So, I, so, I just, uh, so I'm just thinking you could be hopeful, and, and that's fun, but let's take what you're saying to an extreme. Yeah. Suppose, in fact, intelligence is common in the galaxy. Mm -hmm. however we want to define common, okay? And, or intelligence. Uh, intelligence, How, yeah, exactly, okay? Let's assume that. Who are we to then decide that we are intelligent? Would they, would we defined our own intelligence. So of course we're intelligent, because we're defining it. If an eagle defined intelligence, they would say those poor humans, all they could do is walk and their measly 2020 eyesight. And I mean, think of what, how another species would define who's at the top of their evolutionary chart. We would not be at the top of most of their charts. Uh, the microbes in our lower gut who think of humans as a, a dark anaerobic pocket of fecal matter in the service of their life. Right. Okay? <laughs> That's the purpose of human life to them, okay? Yes. So, so then you might say maybe they need a frontal lobe to have these abstract thoughts. Fine. All I can say, and I've said this many times, I've, I've said this many times, I'll say it here, I, I have to say it again, 
okay? It's your fault. When I think of the closest animal species to humans, uh, chimps of some kind, okay, chimpanzees, what is the DNA we have in common? It's very high, the highest of any animal. Yeah. Uh, 97, 98, I don't remember the exact numbers, um, but it's high. So this tiny little percent then accounts for all the measured differences we find. So what does the smartest chimp do? The smartest chimp can maybe stack boxes and reach for a banana. They will know what stick to use to get the termites out of a mound and, and eat them. They will know uh, maybe you can teach them some rudimentary sign language. That's what our toddlers can do. The smartest chimps do what our toddlers can do. And we have poetry and art and the Hubble telescope. So, so what is the response? What a difference that 1% makes. But I pose to you, maybe that 1% difference Maybe the difference between stacking boxes and reaching a banana in the Hubble telescope is as small as that 1% genetic difference implies. Mm -hmm. We don't think about it that way because we have human hubris that prevents it. Imagine some other species, be it alien or otherwise, that's that same 1% different on the intelligence scale as we've come to measure it, as we are different from chimps. What would we look like to them? The smartest of us would look like their chimp, uh, their toddlers. Right? They or could, their pets. They could bring Stephen Hawking forward <laughs> in their species and say, this one, pointing to Stephen Hawking, he's slightly smarter than the rest of the humans because he can do astrophysics calculations in his head, like little Timmy over here who just came back from, from preschool. So. No, wait, wait, wait. So, <laughs> so. So, so if our, if we, so, so this is no different from the chimp and the human, the human and this other species. We would not be able to comprehend their simplest of thoughts any more than a chimp can understand if I just pose, uh, here's a sentence, you ready? Uh, let's go have dinner at the buffet later. Uh, I'm going to have some, some uh, carbohydrates and some protein because I'm, I'm on a low fat diet. What, what, what does that sentence mean to a chimp? They have no knowledge of physiology or fats or proteins or carbohydrates or health or calories, but it's a simple sentence coming from me. Imagine the conversations this other species would have, contemplating the cosmos. So, so I, if your, your thought that maybe intelligence is inevitable and it can take, reach extreme limits beyond us, not only biologically but technologically, I fear the day we come upon a species such as that. Because they, maybe I don't fear it, maybe I would just hope that all they would do for us is create a zoo where we are happy. And, and, <laughs> and maybe that is what they call Earth. Well, you know that the chimp actually manages <laughs> their diet and health a hell of a lot better than we do. So. No, I, I'm not sure, Neil, that, that uh, I'm disagreeing with you, but I'm also not pessimistic. I, I want to find out. It's good. If, the chimps, really wanna... if the chimps had evening TV, yeah, get, give them sodas, give them a big Slurpee, they'll get fat and lazy <laughs> like the rest of the humans. They'll be, they'll be fine. All right. So you don't want to meet a pet. You, um... yeah, I, I, if, I, if maybe we already are the pets of this intelligent species that created Earth as a zoo for their entertainment, and this zoo contains humans, and occasionally we get boring to them, so they throw in some weird politics, or some <laughs> that we, and that it's, so we are their evening entertainment, maybe. That's we, what you're gonna, gonna get. Have, are we gonna have a long run? Or are we gonna <laughs> be canceled next season? Yeah, you don't want to be canceled because of low ratings. So, <laughs> so I just want you to be careful of what you wish for by saying maybe there are species that are uh, evolution has taken their intelligence beyond where ours, it, ours is, and so too would then be their technology. Yeah, I actually, I don't wish one way or another. I want to know what is. What has the universe done? 
with, uh, you know, 13. Any good scientist, billion. that's exactly what should be thought of. Yeah. All right. So um, when we were talking the other day, we talked about the singularity, right? So what do we mean by that for this audience? And um, do you think it might happen? We heard some indications from Peter Schwartz yesterday, yes, but not for a long time. Uh, and what does it mean if it happens? What happens to the biologicals? So why don't you explain what it is and, and what well, do you think about it? Well, first, I'm angry that the whole singularity movement took the word singularity at all, because that belongs in the middle of a black hole, okay? <laughs> So they like we just stole heard a nice they stole the wor this word singularity and applying it to some future time where uh, cyber and biology merge and would possibly become indistinguishable. And it's an intriguing uh, hypothesis. And I, I, I'm not, I, I don't fear that. I would be intrigued by it, and I might even welcome it. Uh, I, I, what I do know is if you take your entire brain and upload it to a computer, to assume that that's still you, I don't get it because we have that experiment already. They're called twins. Twins have identical DNA, yet they do not share the same conscience. And so, conscious. And so, one thought lives within the brain of one and not the other. And they can, one can go to the beach, one can go to the movies, and they can accumulate different life experience. Yeah. So if I upload all that is me into a machine, and I go to the beach, I'm having fun at the beach, and the machine is stuck in my living room, plugged into the wall, right? So, so because I'm not building it with legs chasing after me, right? So I'm going to make sure I can unplug the thing in case stuff goes down, you know? So, so I don't... I think machines will continue to be used in the service of our needs. And that's been happening since the Industrial Revolution, mechanically at first, then uh, intellectually to follow. We had a machine beat us at chess, a game that we invented. Did all of civilization destabilize when that happened? We have a machine beat us at, go. In, at Jeopardy, which is based on human culture. Was that the end of civilization? We have a machine beat us recently at Go by some considered the most complex of the games we've ever invented for ourselves. Is that the end of civilization? Machines make better cars than we can by, by hand, more, with higher precision. They make better clothing. There's a whole manner of labor that's been replaced by machines, and I'm okay with that. I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with that. The idea that we're gonna build some animatronic humanoid the human form is not the best form to get stuff done. We're not very I good. I want a pouch. Right, right. There's a lot of stuff. So, no. No, the Hubble telescope is a machine that's doing our observing force. It doesn't have arms and legs and walk after us. It's a machine nonetheless. And it can do things automatically. We have rovers that know not to crawl off a cliff because it can see where it is and it knows where not to roll. All right? So I'm just, I, I just don't fear this okay. at all. I welcome it. Bring it on. Yes. So um, Stephen Hawking last year produced this uh, show called uh, The Genius, right? Did you, have, did you see any opposite? I caught pieces of it. I didn't get the, okay. whole, the whole bit. Um, and he had, a, he had an episode on this are we alone question. And it made me think about he's, he's dealing with people today, much younger than me, a little younger than you. Um, and I wonder whether that experience by talking to the next generation has brought up any new thoughts on this old question. We seem to rehash many of the same concepts and ideas. Um, do you, you do a lot of interaction with the uh, next generation do you, are they thinking about this question of life beyond Earth and intelligent life in any different ways? What can we learn from them? I, I can't answer that specifically, but I can answer it generally. Okay. And normally it's the job of adults to complain about what the future of the world would be because they have no confidence in the next generation. I have the opposite sense. By the 
the community of people generally younger than 30, but especially younger than 25 and younger than 20, they're born into the era of the internet. And in fact, anyone born 1995 after, that was the year where we discovered the first exoplanet, yes. I think of them as generation exoplanet. They've only ever known a world where, a, a, a universe where we've known of planets in orbit around other stars. They've only known a world of the internet. They've grown up with a smartphone where a satellite is telling them where to make a left turn to visit grandma's house. So they have a completely different relationship to information and technology. And they, as a community, embrace science. They, made, they took science in high school or in college, and they didn't say, oh, I, I wasn't good at it, therefore I will reject it. Whether or not they were good at it, they understood its importance and its value as the foundational understanding of how we're going to protect our survival in the 21st century as a species. So, in terms of whether we're alone, well, aliens in space, uh, global warming, it, there is no generation I would rather pin my hopes on than that next generation that is rising up. And the only difference is they're not yet old enough to be in charge. Yeah. They're not yet old enough to become prime minister. Or to, but the day that happens, that is a new world. And the, the reason I'm hopeful for that generation is that they were brought up global. The same connectivity makes them have a different view of this world. Earth is smaller to them than in any previous That's generation. Right. Well, we've run out of time, and I have to thank you very much for enlightening us, entertaining us, putting me in my place. Okay, thank you. Yeah.